This episode is sponsored by Audible. It is often wondered if when we should ever meet aliens they might look or act like us, in whole or part, as an example of convergent evolution, but how likely is this? So today we will be looking at the notion of convergent evolution, the idea that life forms will tend to evolve the same traits given long enough. This is probably best known from science fiction examples of nearly every alien and robot looking roughly humanoid. Of course in reality, this is because we need to put makeup on a human or stuff them into a costume for the role, but the common science fiction reason given is that their humanoid form is very efficient and likely evolves most frequently. Now, convergent evolution is a real thing in science, as is divergent evolution, where a species branches into vast numbers of very different critters. It's a bit different than in sci-fi though, as it is usually convergence on a specific useful trait or organ, like the eyeball, which is thought to have evolved independently on as many as 40 separate occasions. Light interacts with so many different organic molecules, and knowing when you're in it, out of it, or crossing the boundary can be such important survival information, it's hard for any creature to evolve very far on Earth without having some sort of light-sensitive body part. Now if you simply fold that sensitive surface over so that all the light striking it comes through a small hole, particular light-sensing cells will correspond to light coming in from a certain angle and now you've formed an image of your surroundings on the back of a very simple eyeball. The key idea here is that it's such a simple design that different creatures can happen, or converge, upon it accidentally, and independently. So creatures can have similar proto-eyeballs even though they are not related, or are related far back when their most recent common ancestor had no eyeball or proto-eyeball. We also have mental or emotional convergent evolution, which in a human and alien context would mean both have developed similar concepts for similar instincts of fear, love, hope, trust, and so on. And in a similar vein, we also have cultural or social evolution, which is different from biological evolution, but also probably more prone to convergence with high intelligences. Concepts like having a legal code and a concept of justice or schools, or that even though they have half a dozen tentacles for arms and legs and thus can't handshake on a deal, they still have deals and still have gas stations or stock markets or electric wall outlets. And this is where we get the most key concept of convergent evolution, that is essentially just a fancy name given to a rather simple idea that for any given problem there was a limited set of best solutions. Unsurprisingly, they are often arrived at by completely independent efforts. This is why we'll be considering the cultural convergence or scientific convergence angles today too, even if our focus is mostly biology, because it's an extension of the same concept. We do not know how often opposable thumbs and high IQs evolve in nature, but we do know you need the ability to invent and precisely manipulate tools to get technology so we would expect alien civilizations we encounter to be capable of that. Thus hands might not be universal but something very hand-like is something we would expect to be pretty common, and the four fingers and thumb layout with two of them for bilateral symmetry wouldn't be expected to be common but wouldn't be a shock to encounter either, nor would the idea that they would build houses with triangular roofs, or use a combination of post and lintel and arch designs because those construction concepts are fairly universally basic and so their architecture might overlap with ours enough that many of their designs might be identical to many of our own. Now again, we're mostly talking about when we converge to a basic concept or trait, so in nature for instance, it would not be that weird for trees to evolve on many worlds because there's two critical features to a tree, that it uses sunlight for fuel and it seeks to grow high and wide to maximize that. So that basic canopy or mushroom or umbrella shape makes sense, at least where biological competition for sunlight was in play. Now on the one hand, when a plant randomly exploits that shape, we expect its descendants to dominate the landscape and diverge into separate species, so by default we assume two things sharing a trait are related after their common ancestor developed that trait. However, sometimes two entirely different critters will move back toward each other, converging to that same useful trait. When this happens in nature the results can be striking, with species separated by great distances and time looking and acting so similar that one could be easily mistaken for the other, 
Take the example of the Ichthyosaur, which lived between 90 and 250 million years ago, a large land-going animal that returned to sea and became adapted to full-time life there, its limbs becoming flippers, and even had a dorsal fin. Sound familiar? It wasn't until 40 million years after the last ichthyosaurs went extinct that the first Pachycetus, a wolf-sized meteor dwelling near the coast, followed that same path. We know them today as whales. If you put their skeletons side by side, you could be forgiven for mistaking one for the other. To happen twice, separated by tens of millions of years sounds amazing, but it is not. Mammals alone have separately followed this evolutionary path at least seven separate times, each time reaching the same approximate shape. Why? Because that shape solved the problem they all had in common, how to survive in the ocean. We should first take a step back and talk about two important things. Firstly, what evolution is and how it works, and second, what does it mean for two species to be related? The second question is surprisingly murky. It is sort of a trick question by the way, more on that in a moment. Evolution is both complex and simple, and ironically over the years I've found folks botch explaining the concept more often than when trying to explain quantum mechanics or special relativity, so we will take a second to review it. I've honestly lost track of the number of times I've heard someone who was formerly in the natural evolution camp explain the idea with a textbook example of intelligent design. Most of the remainder tend to leave out a core bit of the concept so that natural selection sounds like a tautology, that the fittest survive and are consider the fittest because they survive. One thing to understand is that while evolution is a core concept of biology, it is really more of a basic math and statistics concept. This is why we can be so confident it functions and would on other planets even though our fossil record is actually quite tiny, was much tinier when the concept gained traction, and is non-existent for those other worlds. Evolution requires only two very simple conditions. One is that a living thing can make copies of itself, but with the possibility of very slight and random variations. Secondly, that selection pressure exists that some copies will survive and make copies of their own, but others will not. This is not the same as simple copy fatigue, where each successive copy looks a little different till eventually being alien, because the quality of the copy and the actual info on that copy control whether or not it will get copied again in nature. The example might be something more like which bits of oral history get passed on, their survival trait being how easy they are to memorize and recite and how good they are at catching someone's interest to recite or hear and recall them. So a story set to a catchy tune or with lots of rhyming will probably fare better than a story that's slowly mutated in many forms. Until the language changed so the keyboard stopped rhyming. That's a decent analogy of how a critter can evolve perfectly to an environment then suddenly die off from a critical shift to that environment or addition of a new organism. The data, or DNA, just replicates over and over again, it is entirely stupid and automatic, and your DNA itself is very removed from the survival game. Indeed, we want to be careful talking about all these processes as the same and oversimplifying. At a math and stats level, evolution is easy. Stuff is constantly dividing and mutating and given long enough should reach formats that do that the most successfully and efficiently. However, We often note that biology is an emergent property of chemistry, itself an emergent property of physics, which is to say that while chemistry is entirely based on the laws of physics, and biology entirely based on the laws of both, and sociology and psychology on all three, and various games we play based on all four, the actual game rules that emerge at each level are so different from the underlying ones in concepts that you can basically compartmentalize them as separate and can learn any given layer without having a clue how the layers above or below function, or how any of their cousins do, like geology or meteorology. See our episode Why Life Exists for more discussion of what emergent properties are. The same applies to evolution too though, of it having multiple emergent layers. Sexual reproduction by swapping similar but very divergent DNA is one such, So is multicellularity, nerves, nervous systems, brains, large egg-laying mammals, and child care and group coordination. We often call these survival strategies, but in some ways they're less tactics for a shared board game than tactics for different board games with different rules, where the only shared trait is the objective to win, and winning is defined as not losing. 
I mentioned child care parenting strategies and group coordination, pack or horde behavior a moment ago, and that is another example of increasingly complex and emergent behavior. Evolution involving social animals is an emergent property of basic evolution but has different rules, trial and error starts getting replaced with some learned behavior for survivability, and even more so for very intelligent animals, where the change is so significant that we often say technological species don't really evolve anymore. But of course technology is an emergent property of biology, and chemistry and physics, and of natural evolution. So this is still true way down the dumbest and smallest level. Remember that evolution is an emergent property of life that self-replicates and therefore can mutate, fundamentally DNA. However, most of the DNA in your body has nothing to do with future evolution. Heck, most of the cells in your body don't even undergo mitosis or divide. Red blood cells make up most of your cells and have no DNA or nucleus and don't divide. White blood cells account for a lot of the remainder and can't undergo mitosis in your bloodstream. They are both great examples of how perfected cellular evolution results in something stupidly specialized to the point of being utterly fragile to any changes, the very opposite of the adaptability we tend to consider most vital for the survival of bigger organisms. It's a point worth remembering though, with the very existence of things like telomeres, which are like a countdown clock on how many times a given strand of DNA can replicate being the exact opposite of what we'd expect evolution to produce on first glance. Needless to say, when we're talking about survival, we're talking about the entire organism, a human, not their DNA, or their non-replicating blood cells, which is most of their cells, not including all the cells that aren't human, like your mitochondria or all the gut bacteria in you, which combined outnumber all your other cells including those blood cells and which you need to survive. Your eyeballs are full of DNA though, even if the blood cells bringing them food are not. And what exactly is the survival strategy of the cells in an eyeball, that organ we mentioned as a great example of convergent evolution? Those 130 million rod cells and 7 million cone cells in your eye do not really fit into the classic simplified definition of evolution, which is to get better and survive and make more of yourself, which each get a little better at not dying and making more of themselves that share that improvement. I'm not really sure where rods, cones, red blood cells, or mitochondria would fit into that, but they are not separate organisms in and of themselves, not even mitochondria, not really. But then is an ant or worker bee really a separate organism, or is it the hive that evolves? Multicellularity and sexual reproduction really shift that dynamic too because it becomes survival of a greater organism and survival of a species. Species is a bit of a dubious concept without sexual reproduction. All you've got is cells in constant division and divergence. A species is really more of a concept for when not too distant cousins can still swap DNA and produce a synthesis of themselves and their mutations. Nor should we say most organisms are part of that classic concept of species because most organisms are single-celled ones that divide, and it would be quite inaccurate to say they were not highly evolved in their many quadrillions of numbers and trillions of generations. So evolution, the survival of the fittest species, conceptually predates the existence of species and multicellular organisms. Or of cells, where it would date back to the earliest self-replicating protein and probably wouldn't even be considered alive, and even those operate under very different mutation and reproduction methods than modern DNA. For instance, when DNA reproduces, there are often mistakes. After all, there are literally billions of base pairs that need to be copied. Errors are actually pretty common but there are spell checker mechanisms in place to catch them. Still, some inevitably make it through, usually these mistakes or mutations are harmless and insignificant, but sometimes they are not. Also bear in mind DNA is not a blueprint as it is often thought, it is a program that runs and repeats. That means a very slight variation can have huge consequences as the DNA iterates. A case can be imagined where a slight variation in the shape of fish's fins allows it to swim a little faster, catch prey a little better, and so have more chances to have more and better offspring, offspring that will be very likely to have those same weirdly shaped fins. That's more time than I'd like to have spent going over the concept of evolution, but I want to stress that simultaneously simple and complex definition of it. On the one hand, it is the simple process of random mutation resulting in future generations being more survivable. 
On the other hand, it is a hundred different games with different rules, some of which rely very little on random mutational survivability, any more than a game of chess or Monopoly or Call of Duty rely on atoms and electrons shuffling between them. They obviously do depend on that, but you never seek to explain the difference in a board game, a first person shooter, and a 4x space colonization game by getting into how quarks and leptons interact. I think that's important to keep in mind as we contemplate convergent evolution, because on the one hand we expect the basic evolutionary concept to exist everywhere in the universe where some sort of self-replication of pattern could occur, or anywhere in the multiverse even, but on the other hand, with a hundred different survival strategies and evolution, of many levels of emergent rules, many entirely different genres of games, it would seem very unlikely we could expect any sort of parallel life forms from alien worlds. On a third hand, since bilateral symmetry might not be universal, a lot of those games have the same winning strategy. Most of your DNA is junk and kludge, same as a lot of software code is, and it's entirely possible that two games in the same genre will share no code, especially if written from scratch on different worlds, though in general would have flat out cut and pasted segments of code from some predecessor bit of software in some analogy or mimicry or subsumption rather than reproduction. However, the winning approach in a lot of games is often very similar. 4X video games get that name for the overall strategies rather than the individual tactics or themes. Explore, expand, exploit, exterminate. Same overall strategy whether you're exploring a fantasy or historical realm looking for rare resources and places to build villages, or trying to wipe out hostile alien civilizations in a space opera themed war for galactic colonization and control. They're a decent analogy for evolution too, get in one and grow to absorb and use all resources. And even inside these, minor variations can result in huge changes of approach, and convergences too. In many a role-playing game, especially multiplayer setups that allow for a cooperative specialized party, we see the appearance of a character type often referred to as a glass cannon or a tank. And these names are pretty indicative, the former is something pretty fragile, able to hurl attacks at a distance, the other is something pretty much designed to take a beating. There are a lot of RPGs where neither is common or viable, but the basic concept was common enough that once the term popped up in discussion of some game or other, it quickly spread to be regular game or terminology even for systems with utterly different rules. So convergent evolution in its simplest forms is analogous to cases like that. The idea that an eyeball is handy, or that the ability to absorb sunlight and make sugars with it photosynthetically is handy, or that copying DNA from another mutant relative is handy, which is weird to the basic principle of DNA pattern surviving since it's literally hacking a big chunk of itself off to replace it with something else. That's the tricky part for discussing convergent evolution, because each of those evolutionary strategies might get pursued and result in some sort of convergence. However, they might each do that in some entirely different set of rules or level of rules, and thus contemplating why we might see the same end product is going to be tricky and varied. Consider, it is pretty easy to look at nature and say, well, four limbs, basically two arms and legs, is really common on Earth and should be elsewhere, and there's some truth to that, ignoring that critters with six or more limbs outnumber the four-legged kind thousands to one, by which logic we should expect a lot more six-legged aliens than bipedal ones. Tetrapods are thought to have first appeared about 400 million years ago as a fish-like critter needed to start developing the ability to propel itself on land with fins, developing robust shoulders, hips, and pelvises, as something tiny critters don't need as much, making many legs cheaper. Ichthyostaglia, ichthyo means fish-like incidentally, are extinct tetrapod amphibian precursor of all land-living vertebrates, including those like snakes who got rid of their limbs or those like dolphins and whales who migrated back to the sea and picked up more fish-like traits. Our common ancestor with ants and other six-legged critters is way further back, and since the only shared trait for limbs is bilateral symmetry, we would probably have to go back to about 600 million years ago. Life goes back considerably longer though and so we can hardly take for granted that bilateral symmetry is common, let alone four-limbed bipedalism. Humans would probably never have gotten big brain, super smart, and technical without a few particular paths occurring to us that are fairly unique to bipeds, and which aren't obviously super awesome traits any more than bipedalism is. We have efficient body plans, I am not knocking the humanoid form, it is a good setup and one I'm fond of, 
but as an example, one of its advantages is being able to see further from the greater height by rearing up on back legs, which the giraffe's approach achieves by a different and arguably better method. Another is that it lets you look much bigger than your weight class would indicate, be big and scary without needing as much mass, but the peacock and blowfish both have better approaches for looking big. Going back on your legs makes it easier to use your hands and let them be more delicate, but growing an extra set, centaur style, would seem even better, and delicacy of hand bones or toes is probably not exclusive to something which does not use them for feats in locomotion. Note that those are survival strategies, see far, look big, manipulate things, and carry, and the humanoid form is good for that, but some monstrous centaur and giraffe hybrid with a kangaroo pouch side mounted like saddlebags for carrying and that it could also expand with air bladders to look bigger or float on water would accomplish all those things the humanoid form does. So again it really matters what we mean by convergent evolution because the driving force for it is shared survival strategies, not physical shape and architecture, mostly. As mentioned, the eyeball evolved a lot of times. The strategy there being that if one can detect changes to lighting in their direction, one can better see one's landscape and other players on it, and act accordingly. Hence it's pretty handy to be able to focus it, adjust the light sensitivity of it, protect it from damage, and move which way it's pointing without moving the whole organism. So things like retinas, a sphere you can roll around, eyelids, and so on, make a lot of sense, and also represent a plausibly mutatable pathway unlike such things as wheels and axles or gyroscopes. We also want to be careful assuming there is any shared architecture, for instance that swiveling capacity for eyes is also handy for ears, cats can swivel theirs and get a lot more data out of that than we do with our fixed ears, and even then we can do a lot with that, but directional hearing lets you pin direction and distance down much better. We might wonder why we haven't got them and we also might wonder why we don't have more than two eyes, wouldn't a pair of eyes on your palms or fingertips or some audio or visual sensitivity there be helpful? Yes, very. And so we might expect that nature but we don't get it because eyeballs need a lot of brains and nerves to run on, we're talking a big fiber optic trunk line not a little Bluetooth connection. That would be a lot of resources and material, and is probably the main reason your eyes are close to your brain keeps the connection real short in terms of signal light time and signal handling cords. Now that would probably be why we see few occasions of more eyes or eyes farther from the brain, it's too pricey for too little gain, but a critter whose nervous system ran on different hardware, like an actual fiber optics moving at light speed, would not have either problem. Shared ancestry, shared basic code and hardware, like modern programs sharing the same bit of code for controlling mouse or keyboard inputs can limit the biological options available. Hard to grow useful mutant eyeballs on your backside if it means mutating a whole new trunk line for data back to there and some new trunk line material for the nerves, to let them be cheaper. Some beneficial mutation might be very at odds with existing hardware, even if with some other previously inferior hardware the new combination might be vastly better no shared ancestry, none of that shared hardware. We don't even know that whatever passed for biology on that planet would resemble ours in methods, it could be an emergent property of chemistry still, but one so different as to be no more like our biology than geology is, another emergent system from chemistry. In a case like that, is the eyeball still evolving? Well, the eyeball strategy is probably just as valid, it depends a lot on the world of course. So subterranean lifeforms living in the crevices of an icy moon of Neptune and operating at snail speed don't gain as much off that optic investment. They might have super cheap and fast nerves running at light speed on thin veins of platinum for nerves, but move slower than that snail with virtually no musculature. The basic paradigm still holds of having good intelligence, in both the sense of knowing what everything else is up to and being able to make good guesses and plans, but might not go in for visual or auditory signals and probably doesn't need much turnover of frames. If everything moves a millimeter a day rather than a meter per second, a vision composed of many images per second is pretty big overkill, but it might be really cheap for their biology. If you're a billionaire, spending a hundred times as much for a slightly better item doesn't mean much if the item costs a penny and the other a buck. Many mutations only need a few lines of code, so to speak, and our DNA is billions of base pairs long. 
Something can be pretty useless or need less resources and upkeep and still evolve, and persist in distant descendants that have little use for it. As a software analogy, I generally do my writing in Microsoft Word and it's been my go-to since WYSIWYG was all the new rage in word processors and typewriters were still the norm. The software package has all sorts of features I personally nearly never use, like the web layout function and other ones most folks don't use but I do like the mail merge capability. It has all sorts of things which were big deals at the time but don't really matter to most folks now, but it rarely loses a feature. Those who remember Clippy, that annoying office assistant from 1997, were almost all universally happy when it stopped being turned on by default in 2001 and was removed altogether in 2007. As the most visible and hated feature of that software, it wasn't good for its survivability, whereas most others remain even when barely useful because it takes little to no effort to remove them and more to take them out, and sometimes they are handy. Clippy was deemed an actual threat to survival. So evolution is not just about gaining handy features, it's about getting rid of really bad ones, and often retaining stuff that is mostly neither good or bad. This is common in software that sees additions after additions, indeed also in a lot of games, legal codes, and administrative systems, also in life forms. most of your DNA is that sort of scrap code. That's part of why genetic engineering is hard, it's tricky to predict what a bit of DNA is going to do when a lot of what it's going to do is an awful lot of not much. Let's hypothesize a random organ that did an awful lot of not very much for some critter that had inherited it, neither very useful or a detriment, just something minor. When a non-functioning version of it finally mutates and some other luck causes that to breed true to that clade of other critters, we now have a useless bit of junk. It could persist for quite a while. If your typical strand of DNA was popping up 10 errors per generation on a code of a billion pairs, and the code for that organ is 1,000 pairs long, you only have a 1 in 100,000 chance per generation of any further mutation to that organ, with only a further 50-50 shot of it being inherited to a child. All of human existence back to when fire was neat and all the rage is about 100,000 generations, so you'd only be looking at even odds of further mutation happening there to either repair it or get rid of it. Oversimplified example, incidentally. Humans may only have 100,000 generations in that time but there's a bunch of us alive in every generation with a chance of that organ's DNA mutating, not one set of cloning DNA, resulting in tons of mutations to that piece of DNA happening, and the big thing about heredity is that if any of those mutations was positive, it ups the odds of it being passed on. We do not actually know if alien DNA would be as prone to mutation as ours either. Ours actually has data integrity involved into it these days but there's ways to do that even better with fewer errors, something we've discussed before for ensuring our safety from robots and self replicating machines we might make. On the other hand, evolving immunity to mutation is a bit of an amusing mutation. Not necessarily an impossible one though, indeed we have ultra-conserved elements in the human genome and other data integrity methods, but too low a rate of mutation really hinders adaptations to environmental shifts and a total immunity or near-total immunity to mutation might be very dangerous, especially if it's applied to an organism's entire genetic code. Alternatively, life on worlds with high radiation, which damages chemical bonds and alters the code, might have very high rates of mutation not just due to copying errors, in which case you need to protect critical biological processes, possibly through some sort of error correction or redundancy strategy. Strangely, there may be some type of evolutionary radiological Goldilocks zone depending on the chemistry and data integrity involved, where the mutation rate is fast enough for beneficial changes to occur frequently, but slow enough to allow the stability for those mutations to play out in more complex systems. This is one potential for me paradox solution, incidentally, and one of the better ones in my opinion. Mutation is already slower in big organisms because we tend to have much longer generations, Bacteria are vastly more evolved than humans because our generations are decades, not days. Indeed, humans are, in terms of generations since life originated, probably the least evolved animal, not the most evolved as we tend to think of ourselves. We are usually viewed as the absolute pinnacle of survival because that intelligent strategy is seen as so optimum when it works, but it could also be the absolutely most suicidal one, permitting you to blow up your world so thoroughly only bacteria survives. Whereas rapidly mutating tiny bacteria follow the strategy of constant fast and divergent breeding around an ultra-simple premise. 
all of which tells us that convergent evolution to the humanoid form is very nearly ridiculous. It is a good, efficient shape, but not a preferred one over all of the others or optimal for all the different environments. However, that convergence to human intelligence is probably less ridiculous, for critters pursuing the big brain strategy, and many of the behaviors and social structures we have might be convergent. Those survival strategies mostly are convergent. They are fundamentally what each mutation and shift in environment and ecosystem shift around, so the organisms have to shift which survival strategy or combination of them they operate on. However, they often represent a mental concept or emotion too. While I generally find discussion of the evolutionary origins of social constructs or emotions over-reductionist and often pretty dubious in individual examples, the core concept seems valid. Love, friendship, and so on permits organisms to function together even when the advantage is lopsided or partially detrimental. Indeed our concept for what's a parasite rather than a symbiote or partner or child arguably boils down to if the lopsided arrangement offers only harm or does not benefit that species while harming an individual member of it. Parasite and carnivorous behavior and food chains all seem like convergent evolutionary examples too. Needless to say, concepts like justice or fairness or hierarchical authority or parental authority or loyalty are all things we wouldn't expect to be very rare because they represent concepts, survival strategies, in those more basic and universal forms. Convergence to concepts necessary or beneficial for higher technology seems very likely, curiosity, working together, fair play, friendship, and so on. So ironically, even though there is not one atom of justice in this entire universe, not one shred of DNA for fair play, justice might be something all civilizations converge to evolving. Universal justice for all, regardless of how many limbs, tentacles, or eyeballs you may have. One of the more awesome parts of my job is getting to work with other creative talents like authors and game designers and I've got a growing shelf of books sent to me by authors who say I've inspired their work in some way, which is both awesome and humbling. The newest addition to that is To Sleep in a Sea of Stars by Christopher Paolini, author of the New York Times bestseller Eragon and the Inheritance Cycle series, along with a film of that same name with the always excellent Jeremy Irons in it. Turns out, Chris is a fan of our show, and it inspired him to include orbital rings in the world building. I ended up grabbing the audiobook too as I tend to prefer to listen these days and the narrator was Jennifer Hale, who I remember best as Commando Shepard from Mass Effect, and she did her usual amazing job. A good narrator can make a good book great, a great narrator can make a great book epic, and so I'm very happy to name To Sleep in a Sea of Stars our Audible Audiobook of the Month. Now Audible is this show's first and longest running sponsor, helping keep us in production for over 5 years now, but I've been a fan of theirs for nearly 2 decades, and amusingly one of the first audiobooks I got with them was Eragon. I love audiobooks and nobody has done more to make them affordable and easy to access than Audible, and these days their collection is over 300 years worth of performances and is growing every day. However, they're not just about audiobooks. They also have podcasts, guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, A-list comedy, and exclusive Audible originals you won't find anywhere else. And it also includes their Plus Catalog, a collection of thousands of titles you can listen to freely as a member, and speaking of free, if you'd like to try out Audible and that Plus Catalog, the first month is free if you visit audible.com slash Isaac or text Isaac to 500 that also gives you access to great deals on other books, like Christopher Paolini's To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, and those titles are yours to keep for life, whether you stay as a member or not, and again you can try it out for free now, just visit audible.com slash Isaac or text Isaac to 500 As another quick note, since we have a lot of authors or aspiring authors on the show, Chris Paolini got his first bestseller published when he was still a teenager, and he does have a YouTube channel too that's got some great videos on writing tips, which are definitely worth checking out. Alright, that will wrap up our look at Convergent Evolution, next week we'll take a look at the notion of artificial intelligence being used for crimes, or being criminals themselves. Then we'll close the month out with our live stream Q&A on Sunday, October 31st, Halloween, at 4pm Eastern Time. 
Then we'll open November up with a look at how we'll be opening up our road to space, with an episode on Earth-based spaceports. Now if you want to make sure you get notified when those episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed the episode don't forget to hit the like button and share it with others. If you'd like to help support future episodes you can donate to us on Patreon, or our website IsaacArthur.net, and Patreon and our website are linked in the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.